Is this on? Yes, it's on. Welcome to the um, last tutorial of the Mass Current ETAPS. Uh, we're happy to have Ken McMillan um, here. Uh, I can introduce him, but I've done it so many times and I'm bored of it. You, you've got this, uh, all you want, can hear, about, uh, read about his bio. Otherwise, just Google him, you'll get more. Um, but I want to talk about what he's talking about. Uh, in uh, his la the last year of his life, Amir Pnueli started uh, pushing this idea of usable verification. And the premise is that we're all working on very complicated things, but they're very difficult to use. And we may be reaching out for some perfection that normal users can do without. And we can sort of scale down the expectations. We can get the people who design systems to be much more active in what they're doing in the verification. And then we get something that is really usable and attractive for others to verify systems. And I'm glad to, get, uh, uh, to have Ken talking about what I think is one of the very promising steps in this direction. So without further ado, oh, by the way, if you do have questions during the talk, Ken will be happy to answer. But since this talk is recorded, you need to make sure to get a microphone. And I think the microphone holder is here, over there, and over there. They're wearing orange shirts, so just make sure that they get to you before you ask the question. Um, and I'll get my timer so I can show it to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Leonor. So am I coming through uh, in the back? Have you heard? Sounds good. Um, this talk is about applying a methodology uh, called compositional testing using a particular tool called Ivy. And the idea is very simple. It's a methodology that combines things that should be familiar. That is, formal assume guarantee reasoning and specification-based testing. So it's a mix of formal and informal methods. Now, the first uh, published uh, publication of this idea that I know of is actually a paper from NASA uh, from around 2005. But I'm going to talk about an implementation of this idea in this particular system and look at how the idea scales up to commercial applications. And one of the things that I'm going to try to argue is that this kind of hybrid technique can be a way of introducing formal methods into the development process in a way that doesn't require as much formal methods expertise on the team as, for example, a fully formal development. Okay, so as I said, the technique combines formal verification and testing, and it does it in a compositional way. So we're starting with a system consisting of a collection of component implementations, and each implementation has its formal specification, and we'd like to show that, in fact, each component implements its formal specification. And then, of course, we'd like to put those specifications together to show that the system as a whole has certain properties or provides a certain service or certain semantics. So you can see that this argument has two parts, a high-level part or a system-level part, and a low-level or a local part. And we'll be doing the high-level part of the proof in a completely formal way, whereas showing that each component satisfies its specification is going to be done using rigorous testing techniques, using testing techniques that will apply the specification to automatically generate tests. So why would we want to do that? Well, let's look at, again, this overall structure of the proof with the component proofs and the high-level system proof. So that high-level proof has some nice properties. First of all, that proof is syntactically checkable. That is, we're going to do the proofs using temporal assume guarantee techniques. And all we have to check about that proof is that it fits into a certain sound proof rule. So that means to check this formal proof, we're not going to require uh, very clever decision procedures. We're not going to require lots of auxiliary invariants about concurrent systems and so forth. It's going to be a very easy proof to check. On the other hand, 
At the low level, when we're doing localized testing, we're then going to have the advantage that we don't have to write manual tests. We can automatically generate the tests from the specification. And moreover, because we're doing local testing, testing is going to be orders of magnitude faster at finding the bugs. In other words, if we can stimulate the inputs of all the individual components rather than the system itself, then it's going to be much faster to cover the behaviors of the system in testing. And testing becomes orders of magnitude faster. So one way to think about that is that this high-level compositional argument is transferring trust from the level of the system to the level of components. And that means that we're getting a large gain for a small amount of formal reasoning effort. And the reason is that our formal proof is going to make testing more effective. In other words, it's going to expose all the bugs at the component level where testing can be done more effectively. So let me first compare that to traditional testing approaches. First of all, we have unit testing. So unit testing means that we're taking each individual component and we're manually writing tests that will try and stimulate behaviors of that thing. And so the advantage of unit testing is that we get good coverage because we can directly drive the inputs of that component. But unfortunately, we have no idea how those unit tests are going to relate to the overall system behavior. In other words, if a system passes all its unit tests, we have no idea if the system itself does anything correctly. So on the other hand, we have integration testing, which is really the workhorse of testing. It's the way that we make the system correct. And of course, it has the advantage that it checks the system functionality. Right? But unfortunately, it's very hard to cover the corner case behaviors of all the individual components by driving the system level inputs. Okay, so integration testing is very slow at finding the bugs. So compositional testing tries to get then the best of both worlds. So we're going to test a component not against the system, but against its formal specification, which will, on the one hand, give us the flexibility to obtain good coverage by generating good tests for that component. But on the other hand, it also, we also know that if all the units are correct with respect to their specifications, then the system is correct. Or another way to say that is every system-level bug now becomes visible in local testing. And that's what's going to make this technique more effective. Now, if we compare that instead to, say, fully formal verification using logics, there are some similarities and some differences. So just like in a classical logic approach, we're writing component specifications. For example, you know, for example, as you would write specifications for procedures in a procedural program. And we're generating verification conditions, which, if they're true, will then guarantee that the system as a whole is correct, or the program as a whole is correct. <coughs> okay. But on the other hand, there, there are two important differences. First of all, our specifications are going to be uh, temporal, assume guarantee specifications. So instead of pre and post conditions, <coughs> Instead of pre- and post conditions, we're going to have we're going to talk about the entire history of behavior of the system. <coughs> and secondly, those temporal verification conditions are going to be checked <coughs> by automated testing techniques rather than, for example, by applying a decision procedure. <coughs> so like in Hor logic, the purpose of those component specifications, is to localize the verification problem. But now we're going to treat that localized verification problem differently. Okay, so the other, the other point about compositional testing that I want to make at the beginning is that <coughs> it gets to a very common problem in system design and implementation, which is what I call the problem of latent bugs. So the idea is that there may be a bug in one component of a system that's not stimulated in the system context. In other words, that um, can't occur within this actual particular system. Okay, or another way to look at that is that component is relying on some unspecified feature of other components in the system. So component A is relying on unspecified implementation details of some other component B. So 
then, for example, if we make some seemingly innocuous change to component B, we're going to find that component A fails as a result. So that's an example of reliance on unspecified features. And it occurs very commonly when we're building a system by testing it at the system level. Okay, and it's a common cause of failure of, for example, reusability of components. So, appreciate it, thank you. So, compositional testing has the ability to catch these latent bugs. Okay? Because the components are not tested in the system context as we're building them. Instead, they're tested only against the, against the interface specifications of those other components. So that means as we're building the component, we're not able to rely upon unspecified features of the other components. And that's going to make our components more reusable. Okay, so this is <coughs> the overview. Here's, here's an overview of what we're going to talk about. I'll start with the basics of compositional verification and testing. So we'll talk about assume guarantee reasoning and how assume guarantee reasoning is implemented in this particular tool and language called Ivy. Then we'll look at verification of protocols and think about things like parameterized protocols, that is, protocols that have many, uh, many similar components. We'll talk about protocol layering and how we specify layers of a protocol and verify those layers in isolation. And finally, I, I want to end, I'm going to end with a case study where we look at the application of these ideas to a real commercial system, which is the uh, Microsoft Azure Storage Service. And we'll see that these kind of techniques are able to scale up to test very large commercial codes that are used in, for example, cloud computing. OK, so let's start with compositional reasoning in Ivy. So our specifications are going to be temporal assertions. And by that, I'm going to mean simply an assertion that has a truth value at every time whether or not it's specified in, say, a temporal logic. In fact, we won't be using temporal logic. And I'm going to use assume guarantee specifications, which means the following. Suppose I have a system with two components, and A is sending some information to B that has to satisfy some property phi, while B is sending information to A that has to satisfy some property psi. Okay, so we'll say that a assumes property psi and guarantees property phi. That is, it assumes its inputs are correct, and it guarantees that its outputs are correct. And conversely, B assumes property phi about its inputs and guarantees property psi about its outputs. So the, ideas of the, uh, the idea of these assumptions and guarantees is that they behave something like a contract. So <clears throat> in other words, every component is promising not to violate the terms of the contract first. So think, for example, about a contract between a landlord and a tenant. So the tenant is guaranteeing to pay the rent, and the landlord is guaranteeing to keep the heat on. So after the tenant stops paying the rent, the landlord's obligation to keep the heat on ends. And conversely, if the landlord were to, stop, uh, were to turn off the heat, the tenant would be allowed to stop paying the rent. So the idea is that both parties to the contract are just guaranteeing to be the first not to violate the terms of the contract. And that's what we're saying when we say A assumes psi and guarantees phi. We mean as long as psi is true, then phi will be true. And we usually express that as a proof rule in a form something like this that says A satisfies the property that phi is true as long as psi has been true in the past. Is what I mean by that little triangle. And B has the property that psi is true as long as phi has been true in the past, from which we can infer that when we put those components together, for example, in parallel, that both phi and psi are going to be true unconditionally at all times. So that's, that's the general framework that we're going to be verifying, we're specifying and verifying in. Now, in particular, in Ivy, <coughs> those specifications are just going to be monitors. And for the moment, we're only going to talk about safety monitors and not liveness. So that monitor is just a piece of code that's going to watch the events at some interface and perhaps remember some state information. It's going to have some local variables. 
and it will make some assertions based on that state, of properties that have to be true of events at some interface. Okay, so that specification, as I said, is a contract. In other words, every assertion that I make will be a guarantee for some component of the system and an assumption for another component of the system. So again, each component is promising not to be the first to violate its guarantees. So this is the simplest protocol that I could think of to use as an example. It's the ping pong protocol, and it has two components. It has a left player and a right player, and they're playing a game of ping pong where the left player has an input called hit, and when it gets that input, if it has the ball in the left court, then it will send a signal ping over to the right player, which if it gets an input hit, will then send a signal pong back to the left player. And so obviously the idea here is we want these two signals, ping and pong, to alternate. So if we looked at this as a message sequence chart, we might get, say, a hit coming in on the left. It generates ping to the right player. If we got another hit, it doesn't have the ball anymore, so it can't generate ping. You know, and then the right player might get a hit and generate pong and so forth. So we'll alternate. <clears throat> so here's what the specification would look like then. It's going to be a stateful monitor that synchronizes with those events at the interface. And so we can state that, for example, ping and pong have to alternate across this interface. So in IV, we would create an object representing the interface, and it contains two actions ping and pong, which you can think of as, as methods or procedure calls, if you like. Now, that specification monitor, then, is going to have several components. So we can start by defining <coughs> an enumerated type uh, that has values left and right that tells me which side of the net the ball is on. And then I define an object that I'll call spec that represents a monitor. And it has a variable that tells me which side of the net the ball is on. In other words, a variable of type side t which initially has the value left. Now, then we have two monitors that, inter that, that are going to synchronize with those interface actions. So this says that before a ping event occurs, execute the following code. It says, assert that the side is left and change the side to right. So that says, since initially the side is left, you know, if we got a ping, that assertion would be true and the side would change to right. And then similarly, when we see Pong going across the interface, we will assert that the ball is on the right side of the net right, and change the side to left. So really all this monitor is saying is that Ping and Pong have to alternate. And this is just a way of describing a temporal property of that interface. Okay, so here's how we might implement that code in IV. Uh, here's an object in IV that describes the left player. It's one component of our system. It has a state variable, which is a Boolean, called ball, that says, I have the ball in my court. And it provides an action to the environment. That action is called hit. And the implementation of that is, if the left player has the ball, then call interface.ping, in other words, send ping to the right player, and set ball to false, right, to say, now I don't have the ball. And then, similarly, when this uh, interface action pong occurs, I'm going to implement it. In other words, I'm going to execute it and do something. And this says the implementation of that action is that we set ball back to true. So now I have the ball in my court. So the left player is just, you know, waiting for a hit. If it has the ball, it will do ping. And then when it gets pong coming back, it says it has the ball again. And the right player then is going to be similar. It's just going to exchange the roles of ping and pong. So, of course, we could easily compose these two objects together and run them and monitor them with the specification monitor to verify that ping and pong are alternating. But what we want to do is test each of these components in isolation. So this is how you would do that in IV. You would describe two testing scenarios that are called isolates. And the first isolate called ISO L here is going to contain the left player monitored by the specification. Well, the second isolate, ISO R, is going to contain the right player monitored by the specification. So in the left isolate, what that means is we have our left player object, and the environment, from a testing point of view, is everything else in the system. And so in other words, 
inputs for this isolate are going to be the hit action, but also the pong action, right? And the output is going to be ping. Now, that interface with ping and pong is monitored by the specification. Right? So that means that if we want to test this thing in isolation, we can generate inputs for it that satisfy its assumptions and then test its guarantees. So in particular, that assertion that we made in the monitor for Pong is going to be an assumption for the left player, because this, is, this action is an input to the left player, whereas the assertion about Ping is a guarantee. So as long as the assertion about the input is true, we have to guarantee that the assertion about the output is going to be true. And we could, for example, automatically test this by simply generating Pong actions as input whenever the specification will allow them. And what Ivy will do is it will do this in a randomized way, and it will essentially run symbolic, execute symbolically that monitor for the Pong action and determine when it's legal to produce this input. So on the other hand, if we look at the right player, what we see is that the roles of the assumptions and guarantees are reversed. So we assume that the pings are correct, right? that, that, that is that assertion in the monitor for ping is always true. And we have to check that the guarantee, that the, the assertion about pong is true. Right? So if both of those conditions were true, we would know that ping and pong always have to alternate. Okay, so the idea is we're going to test both of these components, each in isolation, to see that neither is the first to violate the contract. And from that, we're going to infer that when we put the system together, right, that all of those assertions are always true. Okay, so for example, this is what we would do in Ivy if we wanted to test that left player. We would say to compile that isolate called ISO-L, right, and to close the system by building a randomized test environment. And that would actually build an executable piece of code, which we can just run. And if we run it, we would see something like this. So <clears throat> actions that have an arrow pointing to the right have been generated automatically by the test environment, whereas actions that have an arrow pointing um, uh, to the left have been produced by the component that's being tested. So for example, we might generate some events that look like this. The environment randomly says hit, you know, at which, place, which point the left player responds by executing ping. Maybe the environment says hit again, in which case the system does nothing. Right? And then the environment generates pong and so on. So all the actions that are in red here have been randomly generated by the test environment in a way that satisfies the assumptions of the left player. Okay. And what we hope to see is that the guarantees of the left player are always true. OK, so if we were then to, say, introduce a bug in the left player, for example, here I've introduced a bug by not testing whether the player has the ball or not. Okay, so I could erroneously generate a ping. Then, of course, very quickly we would see that, uh, that this assertion about Pong would fail. In other words, we would generate two hits in a row, and the player would generate two ping actions, right? at which point that assertion would fail. Right? So that means that any, any bug in the left player, according to the specification, will eventually occur under random testing. OK, so now suppose that both of those two components of the system satis you know, pass all their tests, then we don't know with certainty that they're correct, but we, may, we have high confidence that each one satisfies its assumed guarantee specification. And that confidence then transfers to the system. So I can infer <coughs> that, in fact, the protocol is followed, and ping and pong always alternate. And in the case of, you know, in order to check that overall assumed guarantee proof, in other words, to make sure that I have a correct formal proof uh, that the assertions are always true, I can ask Ivy to just check that that proof is syntactically correct, which is to say that every assertion has been verified by testing. 
Okay, and you know, you could then say compile the system and run it, and hopefully it would run correctly. So that's just to give an idea of how we go about isolating components and testing them. Right, now what I'd like to do is look at verifying some very simple protocols and how we, how we write specifications of interfaces. Uh, yeah, please, please. Sure, Kim. Yeah, so before you go into this next uh, session here, I was just thinking um, in relating the specifications of the components to the overall specifications, mm -hmm. couldn't you apply also a testing, couldn't you then also apply a testing method rather than, rather than you know, doing formal verification? Because you could view this composition of the specifications as an implementation. Of course, there might be non-determinism in the output, but you could choose randomly there, and then you could... Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, actually, that's a really good point. So, there are sort of different approaches to doing uh, compositional verification. Right? And one of them would be that I have a collection of components, and each component has an abstraction. Right? And then I'm going to form the parallel composition of the abstractions and show that it satisfies a property. And, of course, I could do that by testing as well. Right? And so the question is, would that be a good idea? And so one of the things about that kind of approach is then that high-level proof relies on me to form a parallel composition, right, by which I get a combinatorial explosion of those, abstract pro of those abstract processes. And that might be very difficult to test. Whereas if I'm only testing components, then all of those components might, for example, just be single sequential processes. And so I don't get this combinatorial explosion of states that I get from concurrency. And so that's sort of the motivation for doing it this way with assumed guarantee, which is to say that the high-level proof is now just syntactically checkable. I, ha I don't have to do it by testing. But, but you're right that you could, of course, do it. Uh, you could, of course, do it in the other way. And that, and that might be very effective in, in some cases. Yeah. So, since you just mentioned concurrency, um, how do you handle concurrency, actually? Because um, as far as I saw it, that, for example, in the ping pong thingy there, mm -hmm. that um, the left player checks if ball and then sends the signal and then mm -hmm. sets the ball variable to false. Mm -hmm. Now, it does... Uh, the signals the environment generates, are these kind of interleaved? Or, mm. like, how right. do you handle concurrency there? Right. So the semantics of, of the language here says that all of those... Act, that First of all, it's a, it's a synchronous language, so nothing happens except when the environment uh, causes it to happen. And then the action that I'm executing is going to execute you know, effectively in zero time or atomically. Right, so, so I think the gist of the question is, well, but what if I were really executing these things in parallel? Right? What if I really had parallel processes? And we'll see later that when I take those processes and distribute them, I can guarantee that the parallel execution is going to be consistent with that sequential execution by making an argument about left movers and right movers. But that's actually that's a little further on in the talk. So. Okay, uh, thank so, you. So I'll try to, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get to that, and if not, then, then, then ask later. Okay, so here's now an example of a really simple uh, parameterized protocol where we have n processes, and it's just a mutual exclusion protocol that passes a token around a ring. So the idea is that I have a collection of servers. Each one is providing a grant to a resource to some client, so if it has the token, it will send the grant signal to the client. And when the client is done with the resource, it will send release, and the server will then pass the token on to the next server by issuing a, a transfer message. Okay, so extremely simple protocol. And what we'll start with is just, is just giving a service specification for that protocol. In other words, what does it look like from the point of view of the clients? So here's an example of such a monitor. Uh, 
Now here, because we have a parameterized protocol, these actions, grant and release, are going to have a parameter, which is going to be a unique ID of the client. All right, so we're going to have one grant and one release action for each client. Now the specification is going to contain a relation, or we could just think of it as being a set okay, of IDs that are holding a lock. And hopefully only one is going to hold the lock at a time. And we'll say initially lock of x is true if and only if x is 0. So in other words, client 0 starts holding the lock. And this is an, um, a quirk of IV. If you write a formula with a free variable, which is that capital letter X, then it's implicitly universally quantified. So this is saying exactly process 0. It's process 0 is the only one holding the lock. Now, we're going to write a monitor for both of those actions, grant and release, by which the servers communicate to their clients. So the grant monitor says that if I'm granting, then no one currently holds a lock. In other words, for all x, not lock of x. And I set the lock of v to be true, where v is that parameter of grant. It's the ID of the client that I'm granting to. So I just remember that, that client v is holding a lock. And then when I release, I make the assertion that the lock is being held by the client that released it, right? and I set the lock to false. Right? So I have an assumption and a guarantee here for my little ring-shaped server. Right? The assumption is about release, that clients always release the lock correctly, and the guarantee is about grant, that I only grant to one process at a time. Okay, so that's my service specification for this protocol. And we can see that it's parameterized in the sense that I have a parameterized set of grant and release actions. It stores some state, which is it remembers who's holding this conceptual lock, and it monitors the two actions at the interface. But what I really want to do here is build a layered protocol. In other words, that token ring is really the top layer of the service. Right? It's sort of the application layer. But it's built on top of some network service. And it's built on top of a networking protocol that's going to have certain properties. So I have my high-level token ring. And I build that on top of a transport layer, which I'm going to say is unordered in its delivery, but it's reliable and it's non-duplicating. As if I were to duplicate one of those transfer messages, then I could get two tokens in the ring. So I require that of the transport layer. But that, in turn, is going to be built on top of another layer that's providing, say, an unreliable duplicating uh, datagram service. And this service actually might be provided by an operating system and a physical network. And what I want to do here now is isolate each of these layers so that I can verify them uh, locally. So here is an example now, the specification of the transport layer. In other words, it's that interface between transport and token ring that contains send and receive actions. And again, it's just a monitor. It has two actions, send and receive. And again, those actions are parameterized. So the first parameter of the action is always telling us the physical location of that action. So in the case of a send, the physical location is the source ID. In the case of a receive, the physical location is the destination ID. So I now, given those actions, I have this specification object that contains state. And the abstract state at that interface is going to tell me which messages are in transit, which messages have been sent. So I, ha I define this relation called sent that has an ID parameter, which is where the message is going to. And it has a packet parameter that gives the content of the packet. Now, in the case of our protocol, the content of the packet is, is irrelevant. But, uh, but you know, in general, I need to know which packet contents have been sent to which destinations. And I say, initially, for all destinations S in packets P, not sent of SP. So initially, the network is empty. So I'm describing the behavior of the network now from the point of view of its interface. So before send, I'm going to assert that the packet has not been sent already to that destination. And that sounds a little strange at first. Why, why couldn't 
the client of this service send the same packet twice to a destination. But it turns out that in practice, this is a very reasonable assumption. That is to say, protocols almost always have something that uniquely identifies the message, even if that identifier is, uh, is ghost, isn't actually real. So it actually works out well to make specifications of this form and say, I assume that the sender doesn't repeat itself. And when I get that message, I'm going to set sent of destination packet to be true. So I remember that that packet was sent. And then before receive, I'm going to make the assertion that whatever packet is being received was previously sent, and then I sent sent to false. So that means after I've received the packet, I can send it again. So this is a very simple service specification of a non-duplicating transport service, which is what I need for this protocol. So this is, if you will, the view at the interface between the token ring and the network. Now, on the other hand, that transport layer is built on top of a network layer, which has weaker guarantees. So it looks similar, except that now, at the network layer, before, before I send, all I'm doing is just remembering that I sent the packet. So I don't care how many times you, you duplicate the packet going in. And similarly, before receive, I assert the packet was sent, but I don't set sent to false because I'm allowing you to deliver that packet as many times as you want. And so this is a different network semantics on top of which I want to build the one I showed you before. So now that I have those specifications of the interfaces between the layers, I can now isolate those layers and verify them locally. So for example, I have an isolate for the protocol. And that protocol is being verified in the context of its high-level service specification of grant and release, and also the lower-level transport specification of send and receive. So that means when I'm testing this thing, I'm using the specifications to generate the inputs, which in this case are release and receive. And I'm verifying the assertions about the outputs, which are grant and send. On the other hand, if I isolate the transport layer, right, now my inputs are going to be send from above and receive from below, right, from the lower level network protocol. Okay, correspondingly, my outputs are receive, are, are receive of a message by you know, going up to the, to the protocol layer and send of a message going down to the layer below. And actually, because my protocol is going to use retransmission, I also have a lower level service that represents a timer of some kind. And then that service, is going to be some lower level implementation. And when I verify that, I'm only verifying it in context of the network interface. Right? But in all three cases, because I have specifications of the interfaces, I can automatically generate tests that will, for example, produce receive messages going into the protocol layer, okay? or produce uh, releases from the clients. And I can do that in a randomized way based on just symbolically executing those monitors and solving for input values, solving for parameter values that make the assertions true, okay, which is what the IV tester does. So let's start with that top level token ring process. If I generate a tester for the token ring and I just run it, you know, it generates a binary and I just run it, then you know, I might see a sequence of events like this. You know, here, I'm going to be, be executing a protocol with two processes. Right? And those are going to be talking across this transport layer interface. But the transport layer itself is gone. Right? So I can, for example, randomly generate a release from the first, uh, from the first client who initially holds, the, uh, holds a lock. Right, so that's a, that's a message generated by the test environment. Then my server process would then transfer the token by sending a message and use the transport layer to do that. The transport layer is not there. Right? Its role is being taken by the randomized tester. So 
that's going to, that message is going to be marked as sent. Later, we can randomly generate a receive. And that will go, say, to process one, you know, which would then grant to its client. And when it gets a randomly generated release, it would send a message back and so on. So we would see this rather uninteresting behavior in the tester. So we've tested the high-level protocol now, just using an abstract specification of the network and not the actual network. And one advantage of that is that that abstract specification gives us a lot of ability to, um, to exercise the behaviors of the protocol by generating all the possible random sequences of inputs for it. Okay, now, when we get to testing the transport layer, now the tester is going to be taking a different role. In other words, things that were guarantees for the protocol layer will be assumptions for the transport layer and vice versa. So we can compile a tester for that and just run it. And now here, what we're going to see is messages going back and forth at those two interfaces, the transport interface and the network interface. So you know, here's an example. We, we're going to randomly generate say, ascend from 0 to 0. And the transport layer is then going to call into the network layer, and maybe it adds a sequence number to the message. And it's doing that in order to do um, uh, retransmission to get, uh, uh, to get reliable transmission of messages. And then the tester playing the role of that network layer, you know, it's recorded the fact that that message was sent, and it will eventually generate a receive you know, with sequence number 0. You know, at which point the transport layer might generate an acknowledgement going into the network layer and so on. Okay, so one of the things that we see here is that we can test the, net, the transport layer more effectively than we could on the real system because we can generate lots of duplications from that imaginary specification of the network layer and we can generate lots of reorderings. Right? And we'll see that that's going to allow us to test more effectively. Okay, so the test in, in, in environment in this case is generating inputs at both the transport and the network interfaces, playing the role of the high-level protocol and the low-level network. Okay, now, an interesting thing is that we can also test the network layer using its specification, and this is in spite of the fact that this is not a program written in IV. This is a service provided by the operating system. Uh, in other words, the network layer is implemented by calling into Unix to transfer packets, for example, by UDP. Okay. So nonetheless, because it's just testing, we can still generate inputs for Unix and see if it does the right thing. And if we, do, if we ask Ivy to do that, we'll see a behavior something like this, where it's just generating random messages, you know, calling into the Unix networking API, getting back responses, and, and checking that all the messages we receive actually were sent. And one of the things you'll notice here is a characteristic of IV, which is that uh, IV allows you to define uninterpreted types. So from the point of view of the network, a packet is an uninterpreted type. But when I test, I have to give that type an interpretation. It has to have concrete values that I could actually put in the network. And so here, I declare to IV that that type should just be 32-bit integers. And that's, and that's the values that you're seeing in this test. Okay, so in this case, part of my system is something that is, is infrastructure, it's operating system, it's physical network, but I can still test it to see if it satisfies its specification. And that's important because I need to know that that specification is right. In other words, every specification is a contract between at least two parties, and I need both of those parties to make sure that my specification isn't, for example, too weak. In other words, the specification itself needs to be vetted because we don't, we don't know necessarily that it's correct. OK, so now this comes back to the, the question about, well, can I really run in parallel? Right? Because in IV, I have this synchronous semantics that says when the environment calls in and says, um, uh, says do something, I'm going to execute that action in an atomic or a zero time way. So, what we're going to do now is we'll take that parameterized IV program right, that contained all those parameterized actions that had identifiers that gave their physical location, 
And for each process ID now, we'll generate a process that can run in parallel. So you remember we had these grant actions that had IDs, and send actions have IDs, and so forth. So when I compile the IV program, what I'm going to get is one process for every parameter value. Or actually, it's going to generate a Unix process that will take that parameter value as input on the, uh, on the command line. And the reason that I know it's OK to do this is because I can argue based on, um, on commutativity properties of, these, of this send and receive specification that every execution of those processes in parallel is going to be observably equivalent to an, uh, an execution in which every action occurs in isolation or occurs atomically. And that's, a, that's an argument that's based on uh, uh, Lipton's theory of left movers and right movers. And that's something that's built into the tool. In other words, I'm not doing that argument in a theorem prover. Right? The tool has said that um, if I use this particular low-level network interface, that it's OK to separate those processes out and execute them in parallel. And ev every execution will be equivalent to an execution that is, uh, that in which all the actions occur atomically. And so you know, this is, uh, you know, I would make this declaration that describes a process that's called ISO impl here, it describes the implementation. It has a parameter of type process ID, and that's going to create a process that I can run. So for example, I can fire up two X terms here, right? and I can run process 0 in one of the X terms and process 1 in the other. And now, sitting at the terminal, I am playing the role of the client that's, doing the, that's, uh, that's using the resource. So if I'm client 0, you know, that I'm holding the token initially, so if I type serve.release, which is the action that gives the token, uh, that gives the lock back to the server, then it's going to send a message over the real physical network, right? and then it will arrive at this other process, which will then give a grant to, uh, to user number one, and if I type release in the other terminal, you know, it will, it will go back. So even though I have described this thing in a fully synchronous way, I can execute these processes in parallel. So in other words, I can build a distributed protocol. Okay. So now I want to look at the, pro you know, the question of you know, finding bugs in these protocols. In other words, suppose I add a bug to the transport layer. And here's the bug that I'm going to add. At the point, this is, this is the code in the transport layer that handles a received message from the network layer. Okay, and you can see it does several things here. It's extracting um, the sequence number and the source from the message. It's, you know, it's processing acknowledgments if necessary. And further down, after it's handled acknowledgments, it's saying, if the sequence number in the message is the one I'm expecting, right, then deliver the message to the next layer up. In other words, we want to get, we want to receive every sequence number uh, exactly once. So I'm going to introduce a bug now where I say, well, suppose I made a mistake and said, if the sequence number is greater than or equal to the one I'm expecting, then receive the message. Because it seems, it seems reasonable since I don't have to give any ordering guarantee. If I get a later sequence number, I could just deliver it. But of course, that's not exactly right. And if we were testing the transport layer, then here's an example of the first run that I got. And what happened here was, you know, with a few actions that I've taken out, you know, the, tra the, the transport layer got this randomly generated message that said, send a message from 0 to 1, from ID 0 to ID 1. The transport layer gave it sequence number zero and sent it along to the network layer. And then the environment or the, the protocol layer above said, send another message from zero to one. So of course, the transport layer sent a message with the next sequence number, which was one. Okay. And then the network layer did something unexpected. 
it sent back sequence number one first, which it's allowed to do because it doesn't have any ordering guarantees. Right. At which point, uh, the, the transport layer said, oh, that number is greater than the, the one I'm expecting, which is zero, so receive it. And then the, uh, then the network layer duplicated. All right. so, so the problem here is that as I'm incrementing those sequence numbers, if I take them out of order, I'm going to potentially uh, uh, receive the same message twice. That is, uh, when I'm expecting zero, I, get, I take one. And when I'm expecting one, I take one. So at that point, we got a specification violation. So what's interesting about this is just that because I have the ability to randomly generate inputs coming into this layer that satisfy its assumptions, I very quickly generated an out-of-order reception and a duplication. If I were testing this thing on top of actual Unix, it might take days before I could see that event. There's, there's no telling how long it would take. But when I'm looking at just the component, this event is happening much more quickly. Okay, so the test environment very rapidly generates this out-of-order situation, and we find the bug. The other small point I want to make about this is if we actually take our, our full protocol and I implement the full stack and run it, so now I'm testing only by generating uh, releases and, and verifying the grants, what I find is you can run the thing forever and it never detects the error. And the reason is that this bug in the transport layer is not actually stimulated by the, by the protocol. In other words, it requires that I have two messages in flight on the same channel to, get the, to see this problem, and that never happens with this protocol. So that's an example of reliance on an unspecified feature. In other words, if I thought I had implemented the transport layer correctly because I tested it with this protocol and it worked great, what I would find is that I had a latent bug. It's not stimulated in this context. But if I were to reuse that transport layer with a different client protocol, you know, it, would, it would fail, right? because it relied on an unspecified feature. So one of the advantages of testing everything with respect only to its assumed guarantee spec is you eliminate the, that reliance on unspecified features. Okay? The transport layer was implicitly relying on the fact that the token protocol didn't have two messages in flight, and we detected that fact. Okay. So, okay, so the last thing I want to do now is look at how these ideas scale up to bigger applications. And the case study that I want to look at is of a variation on something called chain replication within the cloud storage service in, in uh, Microsoft Azure. Yeah, please. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the, the testing itself, the randomized testing, actually works. Because it seems like a lot of these, uh, you, you're asked, so you, you send a message with a zero, and you're expecting a message back with a mm -hmm. zero in mm -hmm. it, for instance. Yeah. And that's an unlikely thing to happen, say, if you have 64-bit integers or something like that. Right. So are you doing some sort of specialized testing, directed testing, or some such thing to make sure that those kind of events actually occur in your tests? Right, yeah, no, that's, that's also an excellent point. So there are, of course, Pragmatic aspects to testing that you still have to think about when you're doing component testing, you know, just as well as in system testing. And uh, a good example of that is, you know, suppose that you were implementing, say, a memory hierarchy, and it had 64-bit addresses. You know, and you only had a bug. You had a bug that would only occur when you had a collision of addresses, you know, when the same address occurs twice. So if you were uniformly sampling out of the, um, the space of all legal inputs, and uh, for, for such a thing, your chance of getting such a collision would be nil. So you want to set up your testing scenarios in a way that you cover these kind of collisions. And one way to do that is to actually just use smaller spaces. So in IV, I can, for example, um, reduce down a given large data type and say, I only want to use uh, you know, eight values of that type, 
and I'm only going to generate tests using those eight values. And in that way, I can get better coverage of the, um, say, a given component behavior than I could if I used the original large data types. And so this is, uh, you know, so what I'm saying here is not that um, constraint-based testing is the solution for all coverage problems. Right? Rather that uh, I am making the problem easier by using formal methods to reduce all the verification down to component testing, which is going to help me find the bugs faster. Does, does that uh, sort of address the question? Or? OK, so now this system uh, that I'm going to describe, it's, uh, it's a cloud service. It's provided by, uh, by uh, Microsoft. And there are various kinds of storage services that are, that are provided at the client level interface. And the system is divided into three layers. So at the bottom layer, it essentially implements uh, an append a file system in which you have append-only streams. So I can create files, I can append data, I can read randomly, but I can't write randomly. And the stream layer is going to provide replication, so we have multiple copies of everything for reliability. Then on top of that, we're implementing uh, other services. For example, the layer above implements a uh, kind of a NoSQL style table service on top of those append-only streams. And on top of that, we're then implementing a variety of services for users that use HTTP REST interfaces and so forth. So we're going to look now at just the bottom layer, which is this append-only stream service that uh, has replication. Now, the way this scheme is set up, I have a file system with a collection of files. And each file is actually going to be, at a low level, a sequence of files that are called extents. And each extent, in turn, is, in turn, is a concatenation of blocks. So my basic operation is going to be to concatenate a block to an extent. And the reason it divides these streams into a sequence of extents has to do with the way the system handles failover. And so I'm going to replicate the extent and at the point when any of those replicas fail, rather than trying to do some complex failover, I'm just going to seal that extent, which means it becomes immutable and can't be changed, and add a new one to the stream, which is going to have its own replicas. And we'll see a little bit more about how that works in a minute. But a stream is a sequence of smaller files called extents. Now, this is implemented using a technique that's similar to chain replication. So, this box represents the stream layer, which is the lowest layer of the, of the system that I showed you. And it's going to be controlled by a process that manages the streams. And that's replicated using a, using a replicated state machine technique that's based on Paxos. Now, the actual extents, though, within a stream are handled by these services called extent nodes. And the reason for that is that we don't want every time we append to a file to have to you know, run a round of Paxos in order to uh, 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 compute a new state of the state machine. So instead, the clients will append data directly to these servers that are called extent nodes. So the way the protocol works is if, if I'm the client and I want to create a stream in the file system, I will ask the stream manager, this, this replicated stream manager, to do that. It will, in turn, you know, I'll say, please create an extent in my stream, rather. So the, control, the, the stream manager will then pick some extent nodes to replicate on, and will send a message that says, create an extent to the primary extent node, which will then, in turn, pass that request on to create replicas on other nodes. And then we get acknowledgments coming back to the client, at which point the client can now directly talk to those extent nodes. So it can say to the, say the primary extent node, please append some data to that extent. Add something to the end of the stream. And the primary node is then going to do that disk operation. Right? And it's going to pick a serialization point for that append. Say, I'm going to append at this point. Right? And then it will send a replication request to the secondary, which will pass it along the chain to the next secondary, 
and so on. And we get a chain of acknowledgments back to the client. And at the point where the client gets the acknowledgement for that append operation, that append is committed. So that means I'm promising that that data is never going away. It's been, it's been replicated, and I, I do not have permission to, to make it go away. Okay, so if I'm reading, on the other hand, for purposes of increasing the bandwidth of reads, I'm allowed to read anywhere, which actually creates some interesting aspects of, of the semantics, okay, but, uh, because basically every node is doing reads, but each node also has a different notion of what the current length of that extent is. So what happens then is we have addition, a different notion of serialized and committed length of these extents. So when I do an append, okay, that data, that append is rippling from left to right here. Okay, and that means that each, you know, I'm going to get a serial, I'm going to serialize that append because they're coming in concurrently. Right, and I'll have a certain notion of now the current length of that thing. Right, and then as I pass along, you know, the serialized lengths are going to look smaller and smaller because each successive server has seen less data. Okay. But as I commit, on the other hand, right, the one that has the shortest committed length is going to be the primary one. Right? It has to know that everyone else has replicated the data before it can commit to that data being permanent. Okay, so this is going to be an odd aspect of the semantics, but we can capture it in the, in the service specification that we provide. Okay, so basically, if we read to one of the secondaries, we could see some data that actually hasn't been committed yet. All right, so the way that we then specify, the first thing we have to do is specify this service. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a monitor in IV that contains state, and that's essentially a reference model of what the file system should look like at the client interface. All right, so it's going to have a whole collection of, it's going to have a file system with path names, and it's going to have streams in it. And you know, each stream is going to be a sequence of extents, and each extent is a sequence of blocks. But at that client level, I have to take into account the fact that only a subset of the data in that extent has been committed, that is, has been promised to be, to be um, uh, persistent. All right, so I have a notion of what's been serialized, and what's been committed to. And that has to appear in that high-level interface state that I describe in terms of an IV monitor. OK, so the last thing, you know, the last operation that we need to know about then is what happens when we seal an extent. So I said before, sealing, sealing an extent means making it immutable. Right? It's now permanent. It can't be appended to. It can't be changed. And there are two basic ways that that happens. The first is the client can request it, in which case that request just gets replicated along the chain, just like an append, right? and you get back an acknowledgment. But the other int more interesting case is what happens in case of a failure. So if I ask for some data and I don't get any response, right, then I need to, uh, you know, somebody has failed and I need, to, I need to seal that extent and create a new one. So when we detect that, for example, an extent node has failed, the master, that, that uh, Paxos-based stream master, is going to pull the remaining ENs. And it's going to say, what's your commit length? How much data have you committed to? And it takes the minimum of that length amongst the different servers. And it says, that's now going to be the permanent length of that extent. And the rest of the appends will be lost. And so this is, this is the way that the system handles failover. It seals the extent, and it creates a new extent that's replicated on different servers. Okay, so this is now what, what we want to do now is we want to write specifications in such a way that we can say we can define the semantics as seen by the client, you know, just like we define the semantics of our simple locking protocol. With the, with the token ring. So that means that we need to define an interface here that describes all of the messages that go back and forth between the higher layer up and the servers down here in the stream layer. Okay, so that's going to be in terms of things like paths and streams and extents and commit lengths. But because we want to test each of these components in isolation, we also have to describe 
or we, we have to provide a specification for all the messages that are going back and forth between the different servers within the implementation of the stream layer. So the messages between the extent nodes and the messages between the, uh, the stream master and the extent nodes. And all of these things are described in terms of monitors that are holding state. So in other words, every time I see a message crossing the interface, I'm recording some state interface, some state information, and I'm just making assertions about what are the allowable contents of those messages. Now, of course, these messages are much more complicated than the one you saw in my token ring example. Right? They're actually, they actually have, you know, they have a lot of structure to them, and they're, they're large data structures, but the same basic principle applies. So then the specifications that are of the interface, you know, this low-level internal interfaces, refer to refer back to this high-level um, service model. Right? So I can say at any given point, say what data should be passing from one EN to the other as a, res as a function of my knowledge of what the correct contents of that extent is. Right? So, I'm, so my specification is at any moment able to say what is correct data, what is incorrect data. So now when I test, what happens is, you know, before I showed you some simple processes that I wrote in Ivy, and I observed that, well, if a service is really being implemented by the operating system, I can still test it. In this case, these processes are really big pieces of C++ code. You know, these are you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of C++. They're using this very complicated uh, legacy remote procedure call protocol to communicate and so forth. So in IV, I've written these specification monitors just in terms of abstract data structures that describe the contents of the packets. But of course, in reality, I have to somehow inter interact with these real processes. And so IV provides interoperation with C++. And I can, for example, define serializers and, and deserializers for my message formats. And I can plug those in so whenever an event occurs in IV, say, uh, you know, a message event occurs that can result in, you know, a message being, being serialized and transmitted over TCP to the server. So I have a way of getting in the middle of the communication of these processes. Okay, so that allows us to then test things uh, in isolation. So, for example, let's say I want to test one of these extent nodes. Then what happens is I'm going to forget about all the other processes in the system. And I will use IV to generate all the messages at the interface of this process. In other words, the messages extent exchanged with the client, the messages exchanged with the, with the stream manager, and the messages exchanged with the other servers. And so based on the specification state, I'm going to take my specification monitor, execute it symbolically. That'll give me a formula that describes all the legal packets that could be received by the extent node, and then I will randomly choose one satisfying assignment. That's actually using the, the uh, Z3 uh, SMT solver. At the same time, because I'm not able to actually model, for example, the file system, it's, using, it's based on the Windows file system, I'm just going to generate tests, but I'm just going to randomly ingest, inject disk IO errors, right? because the system is supposed to be resilient to disk IO errors. And then I'm running my monitors, so those are checking all the packets that are coming out of this server, making sure that they're correct according to the specification. Okay, so I'm using automated test generation based on these interface specifications to drive the extent node. Okay, so I want to look now at an example of a bug in the system and what it looks like at system level and what it looks like locally. So this is a bug that, um, that actually occurred in the real system. Um, and it was a case of failure sealing, this, this process of pulling all of the extent nodes, finding their commit lengths, and deciding you know, to make that extent immutable at a certain length. Okay, and, and here's what happens in the failure. So we start the sealing process, okay, and we ask the primary node to seal the extent. 
Okay, well, it's going, to pass, it's going to try to do that locally, and it will replicate the request to the next server in the chain. Okay, now, eventually, let's say we have two servers in the chain. They succeed. They send a response message back to the primary. And at this point, we have a file system failure. Okay, so the primary extent node tries to create a file on the file system to store the state of that extent. That fails, for example, because the disk is full. And it's going to mark that extent as being locally corrupt. His local copy is bad. Okay, so then something maybe bad happens, which is it responds back to the stream management manager, and it says this extent now has zero length, and it returns a, a non-error status, and right? it returns no error message, which in principle might be a bug, although it's not it's not clear. So at that point, a sequence of bad things happen. In other words. The bug was here, but in order to actually see the failure occur in the system, a whole sequence of coincidences have to happen. So at this point, that uh, the stream manager saw that zero length, and it said, oh, that's a zero length extent. I don't need it anymore. And so it tries to delete it from all the other nodes. Unfortunately, the node that created that message, you know, by coincidence, uh, after a certain amount of time, crashed. OK, so it didn't see the delete request. You know, and so at that point, when it, it's going to come back online, it restarts. It sees in its log that there's an extent with non-zero length. It tries to, to sync that back to the, to the uh, stream manager. Uh, the stream manager says, oh, this is a non-zero commit length. But then it finds it has no copies left in the system because it deleted all the other copies. So at that point, it can report data loss. But of course, all those details are not interesting for us. The only point is that after the bad thing happened at the EN, it took a whole sequence of coincidences for that to actually result in data loss at the system level. So if we were doing system level tests, this would be really, and it was, a really hard bug to find. Okay. So on the other hand, going back to our unit testing scenario, here, we're just driving messages according to the spec into that extent node, okay, generating them using Z3. And what we found was that when we start injecting disk errors, that this, this specification violation occurred within about, good, within about 100 seconds. In other words, it happened really fast. And the reason for that was when you look at that bug at the component level, it's a lot simpler. OK, so the primary, the, the, the EN that we're testing here, in this case, it's, it's generating, it's seeing a bunch of requests for creating extents and appending to them and sealing them and so forth. At some point, it gets a sealing request for a particular extent. OK, it, it sends out, and that's generated by the test environment. It sends out a replication request, which is picked up by the test environment, which randomly generates a response at some time later. OK, at that point, we by coincidence, randomly injected a disk I.O. error. And at that point, the EN comes out with a message that violates its spec. And the actually reason it violated the spec was not that it had a zero commit length, but in fact that that field was entirely missing from the message. And it was misinterpreted by the other process as zero, okay, because of, of reading, uh, actually because of reading uninitialized data. Okay, so at this point, we have an assertion failure and we're done. Right, so that's all we see at the local level. And so I want to make two observations about that. First is that isolation testing finds this kind of bug orders of magnitude faster than system test for actually two reasons. The first is that in terms of inputs, things that occur with very low frequency at the system level can occur with higher frequency when we're just randomly generating inputs for this one component. Okay. But in addition, because we have localized specifications now, problems that are happening in the output of that component are going to be detected much faster. Right. So we immediately have a specification failure here, whereas it took this complicated coincidence of events to actually see that specification violation turn up as a system level data error. And so it's both, you know, in, on the input side and the output side, things are happening much faster with isolation testing. But the other point, of course, is that 
it's not just that we're doing component testing here, but we have to know that if the system has a bug, right, if it violates that high-level specification that it's supposed to provide to its client, then that has to be reflected in some specification violation of a component. Otherwise, we won't find the bug. So when you're doing compositional verification and you're saying verify that each component is not the first to violate the contract, right, you know that if there's a system-level bug, then there is some local test that will find that bug. Right? So you can refer correctness down to the components where testing is much more effective. Right? So you need compositionality for this to happen. OK, so just to go back you know, and review, I'm talking about a methodology that combines two techniques that are relatively familiar, that is to say, assume guarantee reasoning and specification-based testing. And the idea of this kind of approach is that the compositional formal argument allows us to transfer trust from the system level to the component level. And so that means, for one thing, that if we have difficult issues, for example, in constructing, inducti uh, constructing inductive invariants for uh, parallel uh, si uh, concurrent systems and so forth, all of those issues get pushed down by the assumed guarantee argument into the components. But since we're doing testing now, we just don't do that proof. Right? We just use testing, right? which is more effective at the component level than at the system level. So in other words, formal reasoning in this case is making testing more effective and allowing us to get to the bugs faster. And so this gives us a large gain for a small amount of formal reasoning effort. And we saw that, you know, how this was done in this particular tool called Ivy, right, where the specifications are just monitors, and we can automatically generate randomized testers by symbolically executing those monitors. And what we saw is that this process, in fact, scales to large commercial systems. In other words, these messages that are being transferred back and forth in the case of the Azure storage protocol are quite large and complex, but the SMT solver is able to effectively generate legal messages according to the specification that are correct with respect to this high-level semantics of the data. All right, so, the, so this kind of technique is scaling to, to systems of substantial size and complexity. Right. So the last thing I want to leave you with is, is this. Formal proofs of low-level code are hard. You have to, for example, produce auxiliary invariants for the loops. You have to think about you know, heap analysis and uh, alias analysis and so forth. You have to think about concurrency. And producing invariants for concurrent systems is, is a quite complex endeavor. And so if you look at you know, current approaches to verifying concurrent code, you, know, you might verify something like 500 lines of code per person year. And you're burning essentially a graduate student year for every uh, you know, roughly 500 lines of code. So this is a very labor-intensive way of finding bugs in a system. Not to, say it's a, not to say it's a bad idea, but it's a very heavyweight use of formal methods expertise. Whereas high-level specifications of interfaces are actually relatively easy. Because you don't have to think about complex inductive invariants. You don't have to use fragile decision procedures in order to verify your verification conditions. Really, all of your hard work, all the hard work is getting pushed down into the component level where you're attacking it with testing rather than with formal techniques. Right? So compositional testing is, in a way, you could think of it as applying formal proof and testing in the places where each of those approaches is the most effective. In other words, testing is much more effective at the component level than it is at the system level. And formal approaches are much easier and more effective at the system level than they are at the component level. So instead of competing with testing using formal methods, and we could instead consider how you can get the greatest benefit from the limited amount of formal methods expertise that you have right, in order to use, you know, to use formal techniques to make development and testing more effective. And I think that compositional testing is 
One promising way to do that, which as Lunar said, is, uh, was, uh, was Amir Panwelli's idea behind uh, uh, usable formal verification. In other words, how to get the most effect in your development process out of using formal methods. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Questions? Uh, bank came, I don't know which order. Bank first, okay. Uh, thank you for an interesting presentation. Uh, I wonder, uh, you didn't say so much about how you do the compositional proof of the system level. Mm -hmm. uh, my impression is that, for instance, for this case study, you have to do a uh, protocol verification of this service, that it works if components do their job. I'm not sure if this doesn't sound so easy to me, maybe to you. Well, so all, all the work is in writing the specifications, right? The, those, those monitors that I, that I showed you. The, the proof that um, there's this argument that says that if every component holds up its guarantee, which means it's not the first one to have a guarantee fail, right? that all of the guarantees were therefore upheld, and so in particular this high-level service specification is maintained. That proof is trivial. Right? It's, it's something that you can, it's an, it's an instance of a general sound proof rule, right? and you can check that in polynomial time. Right? Essentially all you have to do is to make sure that you've checked off all your guarantees, and that you've tested all of them under appropriate assumptions. So that's the nice thing about assumed guarantee reasoning in comparison to, for example, techniques where, uh, compositional techniques where you're abstracting all the components and then doing a proof about the composition of the abstract components. Because that proof is, in fact, hard, it, it, whereas the assumed guarantee proof is trivial to check. And so it essentially puts the work into writing the specifications, but those specifications in the specifications are not as hard to write as, for example, um, proofs about, that involve inductive invariance about concurrent processes, which are, which are uh, you know, cognitively uh, challenging. And so I, I think that um, it's, it, it's not to say that, that uh, you know, other approaches wouldn't work and that you couldn't apply testing to that high-level argument as well, but I think there's an advantage to doing it with simple assumed guarantee reasoning. So, just following up on my question, so uh, this seems to be to check your re reply. One should maybe look at some case studies. So, mm -hmm. do you have pointers to specs that were written in this new way so that compositional proof becomes easier? Yeah. So um, there is a, the, right. So there is um, an example of the verification of the memory hierarchy components in the RISC-V processor architecture. And that's actually a hardware uh, example, but it demonstrates most of the same principles that are going on in the, uh, in the Azure case study, where you have um, a, an interface that has to provide some high-level consistency semantics. And uh, you have interfaces between the individual components that refer to this high-level model and so on. And that's something that you can actually see. Uh, uh, you can see the specifications online. So I can follow up on that later if you want. Kim? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's nice to hear compositionality being, being taken up again. I really think this is nice. Um, so I think you're, you sort of, in your example, you demonstrated clearly that there is an advantage in, uh, you know, to be gained. Do you think one could sort of um, come up with some sort of um, statistical evidence that this is better? I mean, maybe you know that Radu Gruso and Scott Smolke a long, mm -hmm. long time ago had this way of doing testing of LTL properties. The research, they had a randomized algorithm for searching mm -hmm. for lassos. Mm -hmm. So with this much effort, they could sort of say there is not a bug with this confidence. Mm -hmm. um, I mean... <laughs> So it would be nice to, to sort of show that you could actually cut down on the effort by doing this compositional approach that you are having uh, right. while still, still having the same confidence. Do, do, do you think that could be, well, be I, such a... Right, so I don't know how to, right, so I, I don't know how to make that claim formal. Uh, you, you could say, you know, you could do the experiment and say, okay, I'm, use, I'm going to do it compositionally, 
and I'll do randomized testing of the components for systems with bugs. And I'll see, well, how long, what's the expectation time to find the bug at the component level versus at the system level? And uh, so certainly I don't have enough examples at this point to come to any statistical conclusions, right? So what, um, what I'm saying is purely anecdotal. Right, but you see, for example, this, this very difficult bug in, in Azure that came up. And of course, in the, in the Risk v uh, example also, you have many things uh, that didn't come up in system level tests that, were, you know, that would occur within you know, maybe a thousand cycles of execution of the, component, uh, of the component test. But certainly, you would have to have a lot more data than what I have now to come to any statistical conclusions about that. We have a question there. Um, so thanks for a great talk. Um, so I have a question related to how does uh, Ivy compare to P? I mean, they kind of operate mm -hmm. in the same space, distributed systems and so on, specification mm -hmm. language. So if you could comment a little bit on the trade-offs between the two approaches, um, I would appreciate well, it. Thanks. Right, so you can do, so okay, so actually I don't know a lot about B, so I understand you can do refinement in, in B of, uh, of, of high-level models into uh, implementations. Right, so I think the main thing they're maybe missing is this assume guarantee reasoning. I think they do it more, they do also testing, I mean, explicit model checking, but more at the system level, um, Right. I think. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, that okay, Ivy is just an instance of this general idea, right? And, and this is, has occurred in other places. Certainly specification-based testing is not a new. Uh, is, is, is not a new idea. But it's trying to set things up in a way that is, um, uh, that is, is easy to understand right, in terms of you know, if, if you can write code, if you can write a monitor, right, then, then you can write a specification. Right? And it's also trying to do things in such a way that the high-level proofs are easy. In other words, that you don't... Um, so that I'm never, for example, reasoning even about abstract processes that are composed together uh, concurrently. Right? So, so that's part of it. But I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, you know, probably at the high level the ideas are, are, are similar. So in my experience, one of the major problems is to find the right assumptions to make it compositional. And sometimes assumptions even explode. You have sometimes a problem that the assumptions become incredibly complicated. Does it mm -hmm. in some sense mean that, okay, the, the hard part is to find the right assumptions. It's a different kind of specification than if you have just component specifications. And uh, mm -hmm. the kind of modularization is part of finding the right assumptions. So, and mm -hmm. now I understand also why you say the proof is easy because this kind of Modularization is part of finding the right assumptions. Is this right? So, right. So all the difficulty is then transferred into writing those those specifications, and uh, so the question is, mm, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what to say about that because the kind there's a particular kind of system that I've been looking at, right, which is, for example, storage systems, memory hierarchies, and so on where the high-level semantics of the thing is easy to describe as a, as a simple machine. And essentially what you're trying to do is capture what is the meaning of those intermediate messages in terms of that, of that high-level semantics. And, and that seems to work out very well for memory hierarchies. It works out well for storage systems. You know, there, there may be other kinds of systems in, in which it's, in fact, much more difficult. But there certainly was not the problem in the case of these examples that, you know, that the specification was exploding. Right? The, that is, it was not actually... Um, you know, the specifications are much, much smaller than the, the implementations. And uh, so, that, but, you know, that, that's really all I can say about it. It's only a question of, of experience. I don't know how to generalize. Oh. Okay, let's take last question here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm just not sure, it's, we're over time and I'm not sure whether we need to free the space. Oh. Oh, so, um, um, thank you. Um, so I think maybe you had a point on one slide that you didn't really talk to, and I mm -hmm. think it was to do with the assumption that you really do have modular implementations that are not 
sorry, I'm here, that, <laughs> that, are, not, that are not interfering with each other. So the specification yeah. may say that mm -hmm. there's only these ways in which components may talk to each yes, other. Yes, exactly. So this, this relies heavily on the fact that it's easy to show that components don't interfere with each other. Right, so if I write these components in Ivy, it's easy, easy to statically determine that you don't, for example, have um, you know, one component having a side effect that's visible to another component other than through sending a message. Or in the case of, of Azure, actually, this is not formally shown, right? Basically, all of these processes are running on separate servers and sending messages to each other. So in principle, you know, they shouldn't be able to have side effects that are visible to each other other than through specified interfaces. But of course, I can't really show that there aren't side channels you know, somehow, somehow between them. But, but I think this is a hugely important point that I mean, you need to know that when you check properties of things in isolation, those properties are preserved when you put them together. And I think, you know, it's hard to imagine, for example, that when, you know, NASA was sending a rocket to the moon, you know, and they tried to specify the command module and the service module, you know, if, for example, the weights of those two objects, when you put them together, suddenly changed by a factor of 10, I mean, they never would have gotten to the moon, right? And so this, I think, is, is a basic problem that we face in computer science. We haven't really, you know, that we don't have systems that are compositional. They don't preserve the properties when they're put together, except in special cases. So, so yeah, this is, this is an important point about the implementation of IV is that it's designed to make it easy to show that you don't have interf interference between the components. Thank you very Actually, much. Well, thank you. Oh, my. All right.